Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for being here and for choosing to be part of the conversation today on why employee fulfillment is the future. As folks trickle in and before introducing myself, just wanna say happy May to all of you. Today is Cinco de Mayo, Mother's Day is on Sunday, Memorial Day is coming up at the end of the week, at end of the month. And then in addition to that, this week is Teacher Appreciation Week. And May is also Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander Heritage Month. It's Jewish American Heritage Month and it's Mental Health Awareness Month, which definitely ties into our conversation about fulfillment for today's webinar. So many things in May. So if there's anything that I left out from that list, feel free to let me know and drop some knowledge in the chat. To get us started, my name is Asia Smith and I'm an executive leader, coach and community catalyst on the Think Human team. I'm tuning in from the Washington DC metropolitan area today, Maryland more specifically, but I know we've got an international crowd with us. So let's connect. Let us know in the chat what your name is and where you're dialing in from today. And I'm gonna open the chat on my end just to see who we've got in the room. So, okay, I see Chelsea from Vegas. Becca from DC, Heidi from Denver. We've got ATL, we've got, a, oh, I see Barbados. Okay, cool, cool. So we've got a, a nice variety here in the room with us today. So a warm welcome uh, to those who just got a shout out and to everyone sharing the space with us today. We're all really grateful to have you here. Please take from this conversation whatever you need to serve you in your growth. And please don't let the growth stop here. We encourage connecting with a teammate, a friend, or a loved one, perhaps even a coach or a therapist to talk it through so you can take care of yourself and feel empowered to continue the discussion in your community. So we're going to get warmed up a little more in the chat for today's conversation. Since we're talking about employee fulfillment today, let us know what makes you feel fulfilled and what does employee fulfillment mean to you? Interested to see what comes in from the chat. What does employee fulfillment mean to you? Okay, we have purpose from Lynn. Feel, oh, okay, it's trickling in. Yeah, feeling seen, personal growth. I saw equity, inclusion, caring about your employees. Yeah, yeah. This is amazing. It's really great to see folks interacting in the chat. Uh, throughout the webinar, if you feel energized to say something, please don't hesitate to share, comment, and ask questions. It's really nice <laughs> seeing everything pop up. Um, this is great input so far, and your presence and contribution always make the conversation richer. You might spark a thought for somebody in the room, or we all might learn something from what you have to say. And with all that being said, this webinar wouldn't be happening if it wasn't for our fantastic partners and the commitment and heartfelt work of our team and leadership at Think Human to provide a safe and brave space for real conversations in the world like this one. So I'm thrilled to introduce Think Human and our partners for today's webinar. Starting off with Think Human, it's a leadership development organization that supports HR and L&D leaders with implementing community-centered and experiential-based leadership programs built to support a culture of belonging. The leadership training programs that we offer, in particular our flagship programs, Leader Lab and Mini Lab, are designed to create mindset shifts and behavioral change over time that sticks. Toward the end of the webinar, uh, a poll's gonna pop up. So you can let us know if you're interested in hearing from Think Human or our partners. And actually, before we dive in, I'll go ahead and put my link in the chat uh, in case that's helpful for anyone out there. Next up, uh, we have Blueboard. Blueboard is the experiential rewards platform for the world's most loved employers. They make it easy for companies to give experiential employee rewards, incentives, and recognition from one of a kind to once in a lifetime experiences. So think skydiving, dining at Michelin star restaurants, hot air ballooning or chasing the Northern lights. They partner with hundreds of the best places to work like Glassdoor, Shake Shack, GoPro segment and more to help them celebrate their people in a more meaningful and authentic way. So to learn more about this amazing platform and how to bring this to your people, visit blueboard.com. And last but certainly not least, we have Lever. Lever is a recruiting software that tackles the most strategic challenges that companies face. The main one being how to grow their teams. 
Their tools allow leaders to scale and grow their people pipeline, build authentic and long-lasting relationships, and source the right people to hire. Lever also provides leaders with customized reports, with data visualization, reviews, offers, and interview feedback, and so much more to inform strategic decisions between hiring managers and executives. So thanks again to our partners for helping us bring this event to life. And before we dive into the webinar, we're almost there. We'd like to share an artistic moment as we clear our minds and settle in for this conversation. We hope that this helps you feel grounded and open for today's discussion. Blessing us with her gifts today, we have Kenya Del Mar. Kenya is a singer, rapper, and musician who combines soul, hip hop, and pop into what she calls soul fusion. Her art pays homage to the classics with a refreshing level of creativity and honesty. She's actually joined us for a webinar before and we had to bring her back. <laughs> so without further ado, Kenya, if you're ready, go ahead and take it away. I am. Good afternoon and morning to everybody. In the spirit of today's uh, topic, I just want to share a little happiness with you all. Kenya for those smooth vibes. You are getting a lot of love in the chat. So we really do appreciate you reminding us not to look back and don't forget about tomorrow. So thank you again. Welcome, welcome everyone. I am Hakimia Jackson, culture strategist, DI board advisor, and global executive coach. And I am so happy to be here with you all today. So remember, you're not just watching a webinar, okay? You are a part of it. The chat will be off the chain. I guarantee you that we have some amazing panelists. So work as we know it has changed. We all know that, right? We are in a new era of humanity and fulfillment. You can no longer attract or retain talent with adequate pay or robust benefit packages or just job perks alone. It's important that all aspects of employees' intrinsic motivations are being addressed from aligning with purpose to establishing a deeper human connection. Talent in this new era are, are aggressively exploring roles that are meaningful, makes a positive impact, and are a part of something bigger than themselves. They are turning their careers into callings. And as leaders, we must do more than just check in. We must connect in. Because studies show that the more connected that you are to what you do and who you do it for, 
helps prevent social fragmentation, it strengthens culture and ultimately improves business results. Modern day leadership skills are needed in this new era of humanity and fulfillment. And guess what? You are a part of a community of thought leaders who are going to share with you today some golden growth nuggets. So please show your love in the chat for Fatma, Head of Community and Partnership at The Human, Alicia, VP Client uh, Experience at Blue Board, and Caitlin, Director of Learning and Development at Lever. Welcome, welcome, welcome to these amazing, brilliant panelists. And so I want to start this conversation off just exploring and connecting with you. So please share, tell me, you know, how important has fulfillment and connection played a part in you feeling fulfilled as a leader uh, within your organization? Yeah, I mean, I can I can kick it off. I think it's been huge. It's been a journey and it hasn't been something that, that came easy from the beginning for sure. I think when I, I think about even just growing up, I had a parent that was really fulfilled in their career and one that wasn't. And so it was obvious like, okay, you can go after that. And in my first job that was amazing, on paper, everything, I didn't feel that. And so I think I'm lucky that I sort of think back to there was something like, this could be a real thing. How do I go after that? Slowly but surely it's a lot of years, right? And I think bringing that, um, that like willingness to think I'm just gonna keep trying even if it doesn't work out versus settle has been something that's been a bit of a North Star for me that's gotten easier that I've tried when I'm when I'm leading teams or, or training or coaching people to to kind of share with the world easier said than done and definitely scary but I think that's been kind of my experience of seeing that as a child and you know taking these small steps and risks and then leaping into some bigger ones to really try to explore that yeah I think when I think fulfillment, it's actually why I got into management. So and many years ago, we won't say the exact number, but <laughs> when I first started, it was because I always thought of myself as very empathetic. It's who I am, right? It's at my core. And I was always told that I was too soft. Um, I was too nice. I was too positive. And I just thought, well, that's bull. I'm going to ignore all of that. And I think something that I wanted to circle back to was that there, there has to be other people like there out me, like out there like me um, who respond well, right, to encouragement and to really getting to know that whole self. And so that's been a little bit of my journey is to be able to connect with others and bring the best out in them, but by doing that, by fully understanding the whole self. I think similar to both of you, my journey has been long, like that's how it feels, um, is that it wasn't like a few years kind of journey, but I came from mental health and counseling and then criminal justice system and in prisons to corporate. And every time, every iteration, every role, I was like, mm, something is missing. Something is not fulfilling. Or I feel too empathic to your point, Alicia. And this is draining me. This is draining my energy. I need to shift. I need to like see something else. And even in corporate, it's not like the best place to be either because we talked about like the lack of safety in these spaces. Um, and it's still a conversation for me until today. Um, and we talked about this in the group call that I am on a sabbatical right now and I am actually in search of what I want in my role from a human perspective and from a gift perspective, superpower perspective, what gives me energy and also what can support my community, the people around me at Think Human. And so it's super interesting to be on this journey and to have these conversations. It's been really good. Thank you so much for sharing that, Pama. I appreciate your vulnerability because in this conversation, you know, um, it's definitely needed, right? To Alicia's point, I was reading a, a comment. Someone said, being soft and, and vulnerable, it doesn't mean that you're weak. Um, this can be a superpower. Alicia, I see you. Look, going on and jump in. I, you're like, a hundred percent, right? I think it's so fascinating to me, the words and the characteristics that we put in order to be a good leader, and I'm going to put that in lots of quotes, because to me, again, you can ask my team, but like I've had a lot of success in my career, and it's genuinely because I've taken this approach. It's not because I'm just focusing on the facts and not the facts, data and analysis and all that stuff, and that's important, right? And I don't want to, I don't want to diminish that, but 
it's to me, it's there's always been this weird boundary between work and between what's going on in the world. And I think we were all talking about this yesterday is we can no longer ignore that. Like those worlds right. collided the second the pandemic hit. And so it's time to stop pretending like what happens in your life isn't going to show up at work, right? There's no secret button you press where it's like, oh no, I don't know what's happening anymore. Mm -hmm. Yep, the or masks right. are off. Go ahead, Papa. Or vice versa, whatever is happening at work in terms of like, the emotional turmoil or conflicts or anything like that, it also trickles into our lives. And like, how are we showing up for our people, even for our family, because of what is happening at work? I know that's definitely something that affects me, not just like from before, but now that we have like our offices at home, like how do you physically separate, but also how do you emotionally separate? Well said, well said. Caitlin, I see you shaking your head. Anything you wanted yeah. to add? No, I was just saying, I think we've all lived that, right? And I think it's it's brought up, I think we were talking all about like, you know, how how is this all become, I feel like everyone's talking about it, right? It's like independent contributors, managers, leaders, therapists, the media, like this topic is just so big right now. And, and how did this happen? I think a lot of it is everything you all just hit on, right? And I think, but people are still scratching their heads about it, right? Of like, well, what do we do about this? Which of course is why we're here today. And um, it's different for everyone, but I think the, us here, us in the whole world, we're all going through, we haven't had to live through this. We haven't thought about these things. We haven't been taught how to think about these things, right? What uh -huh. fulfills you, what motivates me, unless everyone had a different school experience than me your whole life, right? Or education experience, like, it takes like you are now learning these new muscles to build and the patience and the time to go with it and figure out fulfillment and interestingly right it's like you as if you're an individual contributor is figuring this out at the same time as your manager right which can lead to these mm. misses or challenges or frustration with a leader or an organization or the person who works for you right like everyone going through it creates extra chaos and it looks different yes. for everyone too Yes, it does. And then add in all the stuff that we talked about with home in the world. And yeah, that, that's why everyone's still scratching their heads, right? Exactly. And it's Mina, please for, forgive my humanity if I mispronounce your name. She said, yes, one of the best things you can do is show our teams that we are human and vulnerable. And so thank you for that. So along those lines, you know, please, I would love to hear a story about a time where you know, there was an attempt to to be vulnerable and it didn't go as planned. And to Caitlin's point, hey, it doesn't mean that I stop. I need to continue to, to explore, like, what do I need to do in this just new era of work and, and humanity? Ooh, I have one. So for me, um, uh, one of my last companies that I worked for, it's really common in client success, which I've been in, that there's lots of reorgs, right? It's we're trying to figure out what the right role is to support the customers. And so in my last company, I had gone through a reorg and um, it was really hard. I was brand new in my leadership career and I rose really, really fast. And I didn't really have a lot of support in terms of leadership or management coaching. So I was really figuring it out myself. And through that reorg, I was managing four teams and that org was like 50 people. And I was doing that myself, which is insane. And so I was literally giving all of myself trying to do it. And through the reorg, it was really good because they took teams away from me because I had too much on my plate. The way that it was presented to me was, um, you know, the metrics aren't there. Uh, this is why we have to do this. When in reality, I knew from talking to other leaders, like, no, it was literally like, we acknowledge you had too much on your plate. But in that moment, I was talking to that person and I was sharing that I've literally given my soul and it feels like I'm being punished for working really hard. And I shared that. And that was something really vulnerable. And I just got a blank stare. Um, and it was pretty much something along the lines of, well, you know, that's, that's business. And I just thought, no, no, that's not business. <laughs> like I am very much a human with emotions and I have like poured out my entire energy and being to this company and I'm burnt out. And you're sitting here telling me that essentially I failed like what no and so I think like for me that wasn't a moment of shut down that was a moment of nope you are someone who doesn't get it and I'm going to keep mm. pushing on someone who does 100 mm -hmm. mm -hmm. kudos to you Alicia for having that reaction because I think most of us would shut down and just be like I failed this is it mm -hmm. and how much 
is it like the responsibility on the person to pick themselves up after they fail inside of companies and how much safety are we creating for people to fail or to help them succeed in the roles that they're given like it doesn't sound like it was the support the place where you had the support to be able to like actually commit to what to what you were committing and like let me be real i definitely struggled and I have a really good therapist. So I don't want to pretend like I walked out of there like sunshine and rainbow. It was really hard and it really took me a while. And because I had that support system built in, I was able to see my worth and the fact that it wasn't tied to this company or that person and their lens of what leadership is. But I think what's important here is you stop talking about like your ability to see that, right. And to take that time or have other resources, I think to, you know, small examples, similar, distort different stories. But from me, like, I remember when I was in my early days in sales management, the day I started locking my laptop in my desk before I went home was once was the time my team started hitting quota, right? Because again, what we're saying, like, what do we bring home with each other? Yeah. Like, how do we show up at work? Because you're, I'm working all the time around the clock and just forcing that. But I, and then it, when you asked the, the question initially, Hakimi, I had also a different thought of like miss, miss attempts and connection that's more, potentially like personal finding fulfillment, but I think that managers also struggle with this is, I remember when I first was on my hunt, right? I had that great first amazing job on paper, on paper, right? Job that, but didn't feel was like, is this kind of it? Like, oh no, this is what everyone wants. And I don't, I don't feel Mm -hmm. that energy. Um, Was like, okay, I'm going to make a shift, right? I'm young enough. Like, you know, I have to do this, you know, early in my career because heaven forbid we do this later in our careers, right? Like not true, not true, not true. But at the time that's where you know, my head went, but it was such a slight shift, right? It was from like sales support marketing to sales because I was still too, you know, that was, that was my attempt to find more connection of something I enjoyed more, but I knew, I knew that tiny in my gut, it was still off a little bit, right? It still wasn't going to get me there and it didn't. Um, And yes, I learned along that way, but I think that can also happen with a lot of people looking for fulfillment with a lot of leaders or managers that, are, that feel or are asked to help someone with that, right? Like what are the small shifts and the small shifts can can definitely matter. But I think when you think about like, to your point, like a te- connection attempts gone wrong. Um, it's like, how much are you investing in those small, small changes yeah. versus maybe the sort of bigger risks or bigger conversations Alicia said that you know you really need, but are so hard, uncomfortable to actually go after. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you also mentioned on our pre-call, Caitlin, which I really do want you to stress is you have to understand that it's not going to be perfect. There are risks and sacrifice prices on both ends. Elaborate Mm -hmm. a little bit on that. Both ends, meaning the the person and the company, right? Yes, correct. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Yes. We've talked a lot. We've talked about a lot of things. Um, Yeah. So there, you know, I think one of the things I called out early on is like this concept of like partnership or marriage even, right? Like you as a human and, you know, the organization agree at a certain time and space, this is what we're looking for. This is what we need. Like, let's get together. Right. Um, And it's, crazy to think that neither party is going to change throughout however many years the same way in any Mm -hmm. sort of partnership or relationship everyone someone is going to change right and you can't control that right and you have to be okay knowing that but often we stay a little too long either with the ideal of well this is what it was going to be or um sometimes we don't even take time to realize it i mean i don't know how busy a lot of other people are right but like you have a million things on your plate at work outside of work and all of a sudden you look back and it's it's no longer this this connection but there's also this kind of expectation that i think's been 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 put on companies potentially fairly unfairly in my opinion to that the organization has to solve this fulfillment for the person and the challenge is well but in that partnership if the business needs to evolve in the way it does and you need to evolve in the way you do, um, that's okay, right? Um, but how can an organization solve everyone's fulfillment um, and making sure that people are also doing their own internal work and awareness to bring that to the company? Because um, if you can't take time to figure out, um, I know at some point I want to hear Alicia share her bathtub story. <laughs> that's what she shared earlier. But if you can't figure out what yes, life and energizes you, how do you bring that to your company to then get what you need, right? To tell them this is what I need and have them give it back. But people are gonna continue to change. And I think accepting that who you were when you started maybe six months ago, maybe five years ago has evolved and taking the time to pause and 
or what fulfilled you 10 years ago, three years ago, it might shift. It might be you, right? It might not be the organization and organization shift as well. I think you can't you know, put a 50-50 or what the number is on it, but really understanding that that can be a challenge of where the, um, of where this comes from and why fulfillment and can be missing. And yes, there can be other things from the outside, but perhaps we've both parties have evolved and that's normal and um, scary though for, for people that then are like, okay, and what do I do now? Yes. Um, I think to add to that, Caitlin, I feel like the responsibility is on both, definitely the company, the individual, and also it's on the company to provide support for the individual to be able to do their work and the space to be able to do their work. I mean, we talked about how the three of us are in places where it feels safe for us to actually explore things and have these conversations with authority figures, which is not an easy thing to do. And it takes a lot of trust and safety building to be able to confront even our own internal processes. And I think it's important for HR leaders right now to really determine, understand what it means to intrinsically motivate people and make sure that their managers actually know how to do that. 100%. You know, I, I feel so much of what you're both saying so deeply. And I think we talked a lot about this notion of reflection, right? Because there's two different sides to this. And I think what's really helpful if you are a manager out there, and even if you're not, to understand that you have the power to do some deep reflection of what you really want, because only you're going to know that. And the story that I was sharing um, with uh, these wonderful women the other day was that I was in a phase in my career where again, I was just, I was really burnt out. I, uh, I didn't really know where I wanted to go. I had done leadership and it felt really great, but something felt like it was missing. I think we've all talked a lot about that. And I happened to be in Singapore because I used to manage an international team and I was so exhausted. And of course I was at a hotel and it had this lovely clawfoot tub. And so I was like, you know what? I'm a grown woman, I'm gonna take a bubble bath. And I literally took sticky notes in there and I just started writing and like sticking them up on the wall. And really it was very simple, right? It was what brings me energy, what uh, takes away my energy. And then I started thinking about what am I missing? You know, what, what do I really, what do I need, right? That's such a simple question that none of what do I need? And then I also thought about what motivates me. And I just started like writing and putting it out there. And I just looked at it and I looked at it and I looked at it and it helped me realize really that next direction in my career, which actually brought me to Blueboard. Um, but it's actually something that I do with my team now, because at the end of the day, some people don't know how to start, right? When you're trying to say what fulfills you or, you know, what do you need? It's like, uh, <laughs> it, it feels so paralyzing in that moment. And so these are really simple questions. And I think an easy takeaway that you can do with yourself, with team members to just sit, reflect and sit with it. And I think to, to both of your points that it's going to evolve and change. And I say that, right? You could write something today and I'll do it six months from now. And what I need changes. And that is okay. Your career is not going to always go like this. It's going to go all over. And that's, that is normal, right? That's what we have to normalize. So the power of reflection, I can't say it enough. It can be such a powerful tool. And yes. I love you said about coming back to it. That was my call about change, right? Like it, it is going to evolve. And that one time in the bathtub, while it probably you know was transformative enough in your life to share with us, you had an aha, but you've had, probably had to take a bunch more bubble baths like that since, right? And how do you go from that? And how to, if you're a manager and you want to do the post-it you know, exercise of, or just thinking through what energizes you with somebody, not feeling like you have to have all the answers. I think that is a place where people get stuck as well. Um, mm -hmm. You cannot be a mind reader. Like we said, it's hard enough for an individual to figure out what motivates me, what energizes me, like taking the time you have to come back to these lots and lots of post-its, right? And it can evolve, but also knowing that there's kind of this burden often on the manager of like, I feel like I need to have the answers and guide this person. And it's okay to like, be like, hey, why don't you take more time? Why don't we explore this? Why don't we, you know, normalize that yes. this is going to be a journey and it's going to be a skill you should learn because you're going to need it from now until you retire. And even then after and how you spend your time and what lights you up, right? It's not even just about work. But I love that, Alicia. Thanks for thanks for sharing that story. I love that one. <laughs> yes. I love that story too. That's and my I feel favorite. Like what you actually did, Alicia, was connecting the dots and defining, which is exactly what the reflection does. It's like, let me connect those dots and also see in the past what I've been really good at or what is the training I got that could 
actually put me in terms of like the journey towards my purpose because I've seen like the chat in the beginning when we asked that question and how people are defining fulfillment. They're defining it through connection to teammates, yes. through connection to purpose, through connection to like themselves. And I'm wondering like how we should be thinking about that. Yeah. And Fama, you talk a lot about that, you know, redefining success and redefining work. And I know that's kind of been your, your common theme because this is a space that you're in. Uh, but you've given yourself permission to be ferociously curious and as well as accept what comes in that process. That acceptance is very important. Share a little bit about that. Yeah, definitely. I think, Caitlin, you brought up the success um, part earlier. Or was it you, Alicia? I think it was Alicia was about defining success. About, yeah, defining success. And we were like talking about how even success is not something that we actually see for ourselves as like the metric that everybody sees. Like Alicia, you were mentioning earlier how <clears throat> I love that joke about like, if I become a CEO, what happens next? Um, and like, did we get to our level of this is the most I am and this is like the status. And so redefining like what it means success and what fulfillment is for us, like, is it like a house with a compound and a few birds, or is it like a lot of money? And both are okay, but what it means to each one of us to like be fulfilled every day is very different. And that's why when I think about fulfillment, I don't think about it from a data perspective of like, it's, there's, it's too complicated for us to be able to see this through an engagement survey. Like it needs to be qualitative work done by managers and them knowing what their teammates need and what they need for themselves to be able to actually create that space of having them get to that fulfillment because why not at the end of the day? Why not? Why can't we see a world where we're actually fulfilled and we're healing and supporting each other and working, doing good work in community because that's what companies are. Like they are a bunch of people coming together before they are like a business metric. Yeah, and I think it's so important for managers to make the space for that conversation, right, and ask people, because we were talking earlier, right, about how the the image of what success means and what we should all drive for, despite the fact that we have all just met and have very different backgrounds, had, like, the similar stereotypical ideas, right, and so how do you break that and make someone, again, to the, re to the reflection piece, take time to think about, well, what is it for me and what is it for me right now, because it's going to evolve and change, and that helps people make those the right decisions because often if you're too clouded by what by all the shoulds or what you think you want because often it's like yeah of course we want more money or I want to feel purpose because I did good work and moved on and got a promotion like that that checks out right but is that truly in your soul going to make you energized and happy in the work you're doing all day and if you can't clarify that it's going to impact what's on your post-it notes in the bathtub, right? You're going to be writing <laughs> yes. the wrong things that are influencing you. And it's um, getting really clear on success is super important. Exactly. Uh, I, I want to say, um, Anna, yes, human connection. Love that. Yep. We have some really good comments in the chat. Absolutely. Fatma, Alicia, and Caitlin. Transparency, effective communication, and realistic informative yes having realistic resources are very important so to the person in the chat that mentioned you know what hey um you know i tried to be transparent and honest and where i was but but leadership they they didn't accept my response they didn't accept the feedback that i provided so i'm still searching on what to do what do you say to them who who are they are on the verge of burnout or maybe even experience some some mental health issues what are what are your words to them? Uh, I think there's a couple of things there. I think number one, take care of yourself first, right? Because no one is going to do it for you. And even a company who does an incredible job at genuine employee well-being and mental health, it still comes down to you taking the time for yourself. And so always going to encourage that, whatever that means for you. Um, but I think the other part of it, and maybe the more risque thing to say, but it's true, is that you also have to evaluate the company you're working at. Because 
You can do everything within your being to try to be vulnerable and impact change and create the environment that you really need to be successful. And unfortunately, you might run up against companies that just don't have that same vision or don't have the capabilities or both. And at that point, you might need to step back and think, is this the right environment for me? Because at the end of the day, you do have to protect yourself and your psychological safety and continuing to stay in an environment like that can be de- detrimental, I think, to anyone's well-being. Yeah. yeah, I would I would echo everything Alicia said and also flag that that's where getting clear on what energizes, motivates you, your values are, and uh, what success is for you before is really important because when you are in that state that was just spoken about, you often, I know it's happened to me, like you don't even really think clearly. You stay on for the wrong reasons. You start justifying different things in your head. You're so mm-hmm. burnt out that the thought yes. of interviewing or or even you, you aren't even in the state to make another good decision because it has just, you know, totally wrecked you in every way. So I think that's where I know like I have this one notebook that is just kind of like the one I go back to every time that has the different like lists of what I, what drives me and energizes me and motivates me and why I made different decisions. And it's kind of going back to remembering you kind of need something that allows you to pull your head out of where you're at now um, to, to remind you that it's that because it's so easy to start justifying or just going through the motions and, and staying at the place for, for too long. Mm-hmm. Very well said. I do this. I do the same, Caitlin, as well. I have like my list of energizers and drainers. And like, it's so good to like remind ourselves of all of that, because we do forget and we get into that hamster wheel that we were talking about earlier, that is, and we don't have actually the privilege to stop sometimes and reflect. Yeah. And I also find it helpful when we were talking about earlier how people change. It's like that physical, literal reminder staring back at me in my own handwriting of, you know, you have changed and you've learned different things or you've explored new things or you've just evolved Mm -hmm. and and look like this work needs to continue. These check ins need to continue because what you wanted, you know, eight years ago is just Mm -hmm. is just not the same anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. I saw a question, which is really so funny because what I was thinking about is that I have a lot of former coworkers that I still chat with and have been asking me, how do I find a company that's actually going to align with my values? And so I do think there are definitely things that you can ask the company. I mean, I do work for a recognition company. So I I actually asked that question because I've actually never worked at a company that's at a recognition program. So I asked what are recognition programs you have in place? Because that's one way to tie through like how they're appreciating and seeing and recognizing their employees. I talk through, or I ask, you know, what is, um, what are your values and how are they displayed throughout the entire company? When do you talk about them? How do they show up? Because I think that's another indicator of how companies are going to align with what they say they align with. Mm-hmm. Um, I also ask a lot about communication, our favorite, favorite <laughs> subject, which is how do you communicate internally, right? Do you have all hands mm-hmm. meetings? How frequently do you have company get togethers? What is the nature that you're all communicating to each other? Because again, it will help you understand where there are silos and gaps is leadership just meeting and then no one else knows what's going on, like that would concern me. Sometimes because I am someone that, um, I think these women can attest is that I tend to have no boundaries. And so I've, I got to that place in my career where I will flat out ask, tell me what your last company engagement survey said and tell me something that you learned and what you did to fix it. And so I would say like, maybe think about that question a little bit, Um, but I think there's a way to do it where you're really just simply trying to understand, are you actually listening to the employee sentiment and doing something with it? Because a survey just to do a survey doesn't help anybody. We all know that. Part of what needs to happen, right, is driving those actions that fix what the employee sentiment is. So I think those are some things that can be really helpful. And then I want to also say on the flip side, I don't want people to feel like I'm telling everyone to leave their jobs because I don't want that. I think for any, again, employers on this, it's important for you all to hear that because I have seen so many chats that has actually broken my heart reading some of these truly of just really horrible things that people shouldn't experience and things managers have said to them that were just insensitive um, and just not okay. And so I think this is your opportunity to think people are experiencing this every day what does it look like at my company and use this to drive the change because 
it is what we're hearing through and through. There's so, there is so much data out there that shows how much people are struggling and what they actually want, which is tied to aligning with connection and their value and fulfillment. So we have to start making that shift or you will lose these wonderful people. Yeah, I, I love that question too, because I think, you know, I think many people probably saw this week in the in the media, there was that report that like people who've left their jobs are actually less happy or something like that, right? So how do you suss these things out earlier mm-hmm. on? I think a plus one to everything Alicia said. And I would also challenge people to think, go back to that partnership concept we mentioned as you head into an interview, like think about what happens in the interview, right? They ask you a bunch of situational based questions. Tell me about a time when, tell me about a time when. Similar to what Alicia said, how are you going to ask that in your questions and how do you like align those to your values, right? So one of mine is being, you know, treated like an equal. So if I'm interviewing my manager, I'm going to say like, tell me about a time when you disagreed with one of the, you know, managers you managed or your direct report and how, like, t- tell me about it, bring it to life for me, right? Get them to share those real life experiences, put them on the spot the same way that, that you are there because they are looking for something in a real life example. And I think is when we're interviewing, we don't do the same and like, why not? Right? Like it's, exactly. t- bring it to life for me the way they're having you bring it to life. And the other thing is that a lot of times interviews are, you know, 90% of the time they're asking you questions and you get this little bit of time to ask them. And mm-hmm. I think I see people think that like, oh, I didn't have time for that. Well, if the process continues and they're interested, ask for more time, right? If you get that offer, like it can be after the first interview, they may not say yes then, right? But um, you can ask, like, you're going to invest how many hours per week for how many years in them? Like, ask, get time to ask your questions. If they're excited about you and want you to offer, people are absolutely going to give you the time because as a, as a manager, I can tell you, you want someone who's invested and wants to show up and is excited and has no hesitations when they join. Um, and I think we, when we're interviewing, we do ourselves a huge disservice in that, in that department while you can get everything clear on your post-its or in your journal, and then you don't suss out for it in the real time. And I think that's a massive disconnect. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's how it always have been because like the power has always been at the employer level and not at the employee level. And it's so interesting to watch like the global shifts and like the great resignation, how the power is actually establishing itself in an equal way for both sides. And now people feel empowered to actually to ask those questions and I think what we need to have is a mindset shift, mindset shift about like when I show up to an interview, you're interviewing me, but I'm also interviewing you and mm-hmm. seeing like, and that's what you're both are talking about is like, how do I feel empowered in my own self to also be able to have the right to say no or yes. And something that I would highly recommend in the interview process is to talk to like culture champions within the company and just ask in the interview if I can talk to a culture champion. And if you if they don't have one, then that that is already an answer. If they do have one, it's great. Have a 30 minutes with them and like ask them all the questions because those culture champions usually are people that are like for justice and for equity. And they will make sure that they tell you actually what is going on in the company versus the person who's hiring who actually needs you to elevate a certain pain on them. Yeah, I love what you said about mindset and power because it's like we go into this interview thinking I want them to like me, which is human nature. Mm-hmm. Everyone wants to, you know, feel good, but like who cares if they like you if you're not going to be happy, right? Like exactly. does that actually matter? And shouldn't you be there to or get more time at some point to to suss out what you need to. Yeah, it's a huge shift, but I, I think your calls are spot on. Yeah, I going agree. to partnership. Yeah, I was going to say exactly. It goes back to what we keep saying, right? It has to be a partnership and it's a relationship and that takes both sides right to working together to come out to what's going to work for everybody everybody mm-hmm. wants <laughs> yes yes it, it, and ownership and accountability i also hear that through the conversation yes. it, it's important give yourself permission to own your career and keep your leaders accountable to what they said that they were going to do for you it's okay mm-hmm. But again, to Caitlin's point earlier, there's a risk, right? And a sacrifice. And we have to determine, are we okay with taking that risk and making that sacrifice? So to those leaders out there who recognize like, hey, you know what? Um, I'm not in alignment or I am. I know Caitlin, we had a conversation where you talked, I think it was Caitlin or Alicia, where you talked about 
um, how you, you know, create space for, uh, or the leader at your organization creates space to get to know them a little bit further. I think it was Alicia. Was it you, Alicia? Yeah. 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 I think we, we both had two very different, different examples oh, yeah. that were both yeah. great. Yeah. 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 Yes. I would love for uh, our community to hear about that story because I, I do believe it'll add value to them in their leadership experience. Yeah, so we we definitely hit a huge theme, I think, in our conversations on creating space and creating psychological safety, because it's a big word, but it's really important to anyone's journey. And when you think about, you know, employee, fulf employee fulfillment, in order to really get to know someone, you have to show up in a way that doesn't feel superficial. And I think for me, kind of when I start, you know, my working relationship day one with somebody, my first one-on-ones with them are not about their job. It's not about their KPIs. I just start asking questions to understand who they are and give them space to share some previous experiences with me. So I, I used to say, or I used to, I still will ask like, what is, um, what is an example of something maybe a past manager used to do that really used to stress you out or that made you feel um, unappreciated, right? Tell me what those, yeah, tell me about a time. Uh, tell me, tell me those mm -hmm. situational experiences, right? Because I want to understand, you know, what they were missing, right? How can I help? And then I just start to understand how do you want to be appreciated? How do you want to be recognized, right? Because everyone's different and there has to be this notion of tailoring it to that individual, right? It's not a one size fits all approach. And I think that's something that people struggle with, but if you think about it, Think about all the wonderful relationships you have in your personal life, right? Do you have the same relationship with every single person? No, of course you don't. And so apply that to your wonderful humans who work with you, for you. And it's, it's those same questions. And so I do spend a lot of time giving space to talk about those things. And the other thing that I do um, is that I understand at the core that life is life and things happen. And it is unfair to your people to expect them to be productive when something major is going on in their life. I saw someone who shared a very vulnerable story about losing a family member. And I think it sounded like their manager was tying it to performance, which I just want to say to you, that's horrific and not acceptable. Yep. Um, but to that point, I, especially during the pandemic, right, people were struggling. I had so many, I'm really open and honest about my own mental health. And so I think part of it, right, is letting them share and me sharing about where I'm at. I talk about therapy. I talk about my own mental health struggles. And I talk about the fact that sometimes my anxiety is so bad that I have to shut off for a day and take care of myself. And so it's, it's two, right? Like you're giving them the opportunity to share. You're also sharing about yourself, something that's very vulnerable. And that is uncomfortable. We talked about that, right? It's really uncomfortable, but by doing that, you're able to allow them to show up and feel safe. And I will tell you, it makes such an impact to say to someone, I have someone who's in the hospital. My first instinct is you don't even have to tell me, go handle what you need. I'll check on you, I'll check it on you, but don't worry about checking in with me. Don't worry about it, right? And that's the shift that we have to get out of this micromanaging, like in order for you to be good, you have to show up eight hours, what, like whatever the nonsense is. Like, no, that person can't show up if something else is going on in their world. Like you, you have to understand that. And I think if that feels maybe foreign, right? Which I think is fair, right? Maybe you're having pressure on yourself as a leader because of all these metrics and KPIs that you're responsible for hitting, that's okay. But I will tell you, those employees will show up so much better and so much more happier and energized when they can come back to it. They will do the work and they will do phenomenal. Um, and so I just think it's, it's just so important to just acknowledge that we are human and as humans, things happen in our lives every day and you have to give your employees the space. And yes, this is Queen RuPaul behind me. I'm obsessed with the drag queen. So you are right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Alicia. And thanks for sharing that. And I think it's like, like making it okay to even say that and, and model that for your team. Cause I've been on the other side of that where I had a family member in the hospital and my manager was not, it was like, well, what about this deck? And I was like, well, that presentation's in three weeks. Are you kidding me? Right. And like, whether that came from that person or from, to your point, just the culture and the environment of like they had pressure on them from above and I think one of the things we were talking about in this like but it's important like it is hard for you to you know potentially if not you being you Alicia but like push back if the the layers above you as a leader are kind of you know you might get in trouble for that that's really tricky mm -hmm. um 
And I think being able to just be like, I don't care. Like as a human, I know that this matters and that this will pay off can, can feel uncomfortable and risky, but like do it anyways. But I, I think that the bigger thing this goes to that we were talking about in a, a different example is what's modeled from the top down and like, what is yeah. your responsibility as a really senior leader? And, and this is, you know, not as much about like, you know, family illness or anything, but one of the things we do early on within people's first month is they sit down with our CEO. Now, granted, we are under, we're like under 300 employees, so it's able to do, but all the new hires. So it's between, you know, like two and 10 people a month, they sit down and our, our CEO like really models what, um, like true vulnerability and tells the story. They do it in a session called our origin story. So, you know, he was one of the founders, but it shares things like, he shares things like, here's all the mistakes I made. Here's how I started as CEO and then had to give that role up to somebody else. And then like eight years later, come back to it, right? Here's all the ways that like things haven't gone wrong and does it in such like a way where it's relatable, where it's, hey, let me know. I want to get to know you in this small, intimate place so that you feel connected, but also you see it modeled that like, it's okay to mess things up and I mess things up and this is the environment we're in. And so this is why we have these values we do because we we embrace this and we know that we're going to grow from it. And like, we're not going to trust comfortable, for example, of one of ours, but actually talks about here's how I did this to create that space. And while maybe some of these people might not interact with the CEO really for, for years directly. Like if that is you, if that's not modeled from people above, it does not trickle down. Right. Um, and it can be really hard to actually make that space. And then everything we talked about today is really hard to actually implement or for people to feel comfortable bringing up to their managers. Right. It's scary to say, Oh, even though I've just got the highest performance review and in the a highest performer, I'm actually like pretty soulless when I'm here all day, right? Like, yeah, that's a, I mean, maybe not those words, right? But those are things that people are afraid to say versus like, and then they wait till it's too long. And suddenly they're like, I got to get a new role in this company in right. a month or I'm out versus it's safe to admit, like, I'm not sure what I want to do. I'm not sure if this is for me. I would love if you could manage me differently. I made a massive mistake. Uh, and for you to still accept me for that is all so huge. Yeah. I love what you both just said. And I want to add the DEI component to all of this because when it comes to people from underrepresented groups, it's even harder to bring up these topics because okay. of like the issues of power, of authority, of imposter syndrome. Yeah. Like I was telling um, these like wonderful people in our previous chats, how like it took me years to actually open up to our CEO and be able to give her feedback or be able to even like state my opinion in meetings. And that took a lot of patience and a lot of trust building to actually like, you know, get and support to actually get rid of like all the things that we compounded, like similar to, to you, Alicia, I was told like too excited, too positive, too this, too that, too curly hair. And when you will receive all of that for so long, you just like, you know, close yourself up um, and have a hard time building that trust and that relationship. And usually I've worked with people that I manage that it took them also a long time to open up to me. Although, and but I know that experience. So as a manager, I would show up differently. Yeah. And so I do also challenge managers to think about the DEI component of their approaches and how like sometimes they can cut up after listening to this webinar, come to people and be like, okay, tell me everything. Alicia gave me this. <laughs> <laughs> and I am sure we're gonna figure this out together. Like it's not gonna be one conversation. It's gonna be like you being comfortable in your own being to be open and create a space for people to open up and also building that trust uh, and taking time to building that trust because society really tore, tore down that for us. And it's, it's, a, it's a tough job to actually build that up in partnership. Right, and it's, it's, a, yeah. it's a journey, right? It's, it's not just a check mark. We have to figure out a ways on how we can embed it throughout the entire employee life cycle. Not just when they check in, not just at promotion, but all throughout, even during the down times, right? Those dark times. Uh, Caitlin, I cut you off. And then we're also gonna have a poll right after her conversation. And I haven't forgot about you, Anna. I see your question. So we're gonna get to it as well. Yeah, I was just gonna add into, on top of what I and actually you, Hakimia said too, like being okay to experiment and dare I say, get it wrong, right? Because otherwise we are just afraid to fail 
And so we do nothing. And with like, whether it's DEI or fulfillment or these yeah. awkward conversations where you feel like as the manager, you have to solve this whole person's motivation, career, everything issue, all of these things. But especially I think around DEI, I will say, I think a lot of people are afraid to get it wrong. They shy back, but right. gosh, what is, then you just don't do anything, right? Versus let me try, let me get it wrong for the sake of learning to get it right. And the impact that can have down the line, like not forgetting that what that impact could have for so many different people for 40 more years is very um, way more impactful and positive than keeping quiet for the next 40 years. <laughs> exactly. And so with that, we are going to take a short little brief pause. We have a poll. Please don't leave us. We still have some awesome uh, questions after this. But please select which organization you would like to continue the conversation and potential uh, partnership with Blue Board, Think Human, Lever. Uh, they are providing all of the golden nuggets today. So please don't hesitate to reach out to them. All right. I'm going to give you a couple more seconds to select which organization you would like to connect with. And we're gonna continue the conversation. So Anna, thank you so much. Annie, I'm sorry for your patience. We have a question here. Do you have any recommendations or strategies on how to create a culture champion program? Culture champion, sorry. I was like, that delayed for me. I swear I fixed my internet for this. Yeah, I think, I think there's a couple, I think there's a couple of things you can do for like culture first champions. I think at the end of the day, it really, that's why we were talking about this, but it starts with why. And so I think you have to understand before you create champions, what is your culture supposed yeah. to be, right? Mm. You have to define how do you want people to show up? And again, I'm going to keep harping on values because I think whether it's your values or a mission statement, I love values. Um, I think it's an easy way and that should be a conversation that happens with the whole company. If you're a startup that was founded 10 years ago, if you're a company that's been around forever, you should probably take a poll to understand if people actually feel aligned with your values, right? Because there's nothing wrong with doing a refresh. I've worked with so many companies who've done that because that's a good way to understand, right? How people will show up. Once you have that really clearly defined, I think from there, it's all about giving people the space and opportunity to show up. And so how do they do that? Especially if you're in a small company, before we got to the size that we are, we really had people that were responsible for thinking about what we wanted our culture to be and how we were going to celebrate employees. And so they were given a budget and they were just given full creativity. And it wasn't a huge budget, but to say like, how do we, and they were doing things like, breakfast club Mondays, where we actually didn't buy anything as Blue Board. We encouraged everybody to partner with somebody. They would make breakfast and serve it to people, and then it would rotate, right? And it was just a great way for us all to bond, and that didn't cost any money. And then there were things that we would do, right, that were more team-building events, but that was all by that group of wonderful humans that were responsible for um, really driving culture. And because they felt like they had such a, an ownership in it, they would then go and promote, promote, promote. And it really did. Um, I'm actually seeing a screen of our wonderful Queen Hannah, <laughs> who's been helping uh, with the webinar behind the scenes. But she was one of those people when I first started, she was the first person to come up and greet me and talk about why she loved Blueboard so much. I didn't even ask her. And I think that that speaks mm -hmm. for itself, right? She was just so excited to share what I could gain from Blueboard. And like, that was all because she was part of this culture group. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Plus one to ensuring it's cross-functional as a member of the people team. I think a lot of people look to HR people teams to do these things. And the risk is, well, if I do it, it's going to be Caitlin's company, right? Like it's not, that's not, that's not what, that's not what we want, right? You, how do you make sure that everyone is heard and involved and like putting it on one team. I don't even want to say not fair. That's not even the end takeaway. It's you're not going to get what you need, right? It needs to be really cross-functional and it's totally fine to be outside of, you know, that stuff. And I don't want to say it's not their job, but it, while they can help facilitate that, you just run the risk of having it be very isolated and just being really aware that there's so many other people in the org that can contribute to this and should be consulted and contributed and contributing while they do this. Because otherwise it's not going to spread like right the culture needs and it's also okay to have different pockets of culture too I think sometimes people worry like oh that team's a little different or I don't know they're not following the bigger thing it's like but are but if they have their own thing and is it working and or is there something we can <laughs> learn from it or does that every team is different right oh, wow. um, and being okay to that yeah.
Yeah. Yes. In this one minute that we have left, Fatma, please, are there any other tools, techniques, practices, key takeaways that you want to share? I think in hearing you both just to build on the culture piece, because I was part of the culture team, uh, still am, is that you designate people that actually feel excited about the company and the culture at their core. Like this is not something you can mimic, you can like be a comedian about, like it needs to be an authentic connection to the culture right. and a real belief in it, because that is so felt in the activities they will do in the conversations they will have with people and to focus on the values and to drive behavior from that, because like values are amazing, but then we need to actually see behavior to be able to actually believe people and trust them and uh, to over-index on that from the culture. Yes. Team. It's very yes. Correct. Thank you so much, Fatma, for that. And we thank you so much, community, for joining us. Please remember this, that no work is insignificant. All labor that uplifts humanity has dignity and importance. You are important. Thank you again. Blessings to all. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank so you, nice everyone. To all of you. Thank you.